On August 6, 2010, the Deer Park fire is ignited by lightning on the Sawtooth National Forest in central Idaho. Smoke jumpers are ordered to staff the fire, which due to dry conditions and high winds quickly grew to several hundred acres. The jumpers set up a Type 3 incident management team and order additional resources. On August 10th, hotshot crews are planning a burnout operation in Division C. After the morning briefing, the Flathead hotshots are moving into position for the burnout. Matt Levine is assigned to be the lookout for the operation, and while hiking up to his post, the steep ridgeline took him up a narrow rocky section where he stumbled and reached out to steady his balance. We've all done a similar innocent move, but this time Division Charlie's day was not going to go as planned. And I lost my footing and reached out to what I thought was solid cliff, and when I put my hand up against the cliff, um, the rock started to move back towards me and I tried as best I could to try to deflect it with my hand. There are rocks on either side of me, and the rock kind of glanced off my shoulder a little bit, as much as a 200-pound rock can glance off somebody's shoulder, and it landed on my femur, and from that point, things were a little fuzzy because of the injury, I guess. The next thing I remembered is sitting in the chute looking down the hill with my left leg bent out, bent out to my side in, I guess, moderate pain. I remembered when the rock landed on my leg, I felt a pop or a snap, and I didn't know if it was my knee or my femur. Um, being an EMT, I tried to assess myself in a few seconds and then went for my radio. I got my radio and tried to call multiple people on our crew and couldn't get out and then I realized that my batteries were dead. So found my batteries, new batteries and put those in and got a hold of, I believe it was Borg, my foreman. Squad leader Matt Counts is heading up the ridge with the bulk of the flatheads, which includes two EMTs. Over the crew channel, they learn about the potentially life-threatening situation. They are closest to Matt Levine's location and power towards him. Harv called division, said we have a, a medical emergency, we need to clear the traffic. And, um, and, and right around that time, Matt Counts, our other squad leader, got to the scene and he uh, established himself as the kind of IC of the medical situation right there on the hill. And the rest of us started moving there to provide support. I was glad that we had some familiar EMTs on scene. Ben Fosnott is a good friend of mine, and he he kind of took charge of the scene as the lead EMT. And with me being an EMT myself, he allowed me to make some calls on my medical situation. Over the next 15 minutes, the remaining members of the Flathead crew converged on the injury area. They were also joined by the division soup and personnel from the Texas Canyon Hotshots, Smoke Jumpers, and neighboring divisions. Life Flight was ordered and the Helibase sent a trauma kit sling on its way. So as they're progressing with clearing the line from that down to the heli spot and actually cutting the helipad out and tripping the trees, falling the trees down and making it a good heli spot, everything seemed to go really smooth. Me and Sean already have it pre-planned that we're, uh, you know, if there's anything medical, he's going to be in charge, you know, so. Harv and I have been working together for 13 plus years. Uh, I come from a little bit of a structure fire, uh, medical ambulance working background, so I have some background in that. On his way up the ridge to Matt Levine, squad leader Matt Counts had noticed a possible medevac helispot site. Soup Harvey Carr and squad leader Bert Smith also made note of another site on their way down. It was decided that the first site was flatter and needed less improvement, and the crews began work on medevac spot one. The trauma kit sling load arrives, but it is too steep and confined where Matt is laying to safely get him onto the backboard. So <laughs> Levine, he toughed it out. He slid downhill 10 feet, 15 feet, you know, through the shale, um, holding his leg, and the other EMTs kind of supporting him, and uh, we actually got a belt around his chest and then just 
slowly, as methodically as we could, scooted him down the hill on his, you know, moving at his pace, you know, because he had to, you know, he was dealing with the pain threshold and got him down to the backboard and then started getting him packaged. After I was packaged, um, Borg gave a briefing to Texas Canyon and the Flathead and told them about the conveyor belt method of moving a patient on a backboard. And I, have, I had done it in the past on some search and rescues in New Hampshire. And I, when he said that, I knew that he was right on with that. That was the way that it was going to go smoothest. It's very, very difficult to carry a litter or a backboard um, through that kind of terrain. If you have limited personnel with you, if you're just with a squad of six people, you, if that's what you have to do, that's what you do. But if you've got the resources, consider the conveyor belt method of transport, which is, you know, six people lift the litter, and then they're holding it, and then two lines of people spread out ahead of that litter, facing each other, and then you just pass the litter along, and as the litter goes by you and your hands come off it, then you displace out around and get back to the front of the line, get your feet set up, get a good place to stand, get your back ready, get your stuff squared away, and then as it comes by, you just pass it right on by. It's very smooth and it's very effective. When the ship came overhead, it orbited a few times and we kept trying to get it on the radio. I tried three different frequencies, programmed other frequencies, and then reprogrammed those three frequencies. I was unable to contact LifeLight. No one had contact with LifeLight. We didn't think he was gonna land. When he came in and looked at the spot and orbited, we thought, well, he doesn't have communication with us. He's not gonna land. And all of a sudden he comes right back around and landed right away. Previous to this, I had been speaking with Bert Smith and he was the one marshalling the helicopter in. And we'd talked about if something went wrong, where we were gonna run, or if the helicopter wasn't doing anything that he wanted it to do or wasn't coming in correctly, that he was gonna marshal the aircraft. The helicopter landed on the pad, scooted a little forward, and the medical nurse opened the door, looked out the door, checked the pad, shut the door, talked to the pilot, and then opened the door and got out. And Bert told him, said, you're not on the pad all the way. He said, set short. They could see it. He said, tell the pilot he's got to move forward or he's got to hold hover, hold power there and keep the weight off the skids till we get him down there. And we're, we're ready to move Matt at this time. Medical nurse got back in, grabbed his bags, talked to the pilot and exited the helicopter. At which point the pilot eased back on the collective, the helicopter started spooling down and then it started to settle backwards. And it wasn't fast, it was almost like a cartoon with one of those things that go so slow that you wanna go out and grab it, but you know it's a helicopter, so you're not gonna go out and grab a helicopter as the rotors are moving. As it started to set back, the pilot had that look of fear in his face. He actually opened his door and went to step out, got yanked by the cable on his helmet and realized that he probably shouldn't be getting out of the helicopter as it's starting to settle backwards and shut his door and just rode it out as it tipped back onto its tail rotor. So we're doing our conveyor, we're taking Matt down and we got to within 30, 40 yards and I could see the people, uh, I knew something wasn't right because I saw them running away from the helispot. And, I, and then I got a call, hey, hold the patient. Uh, there's a problem with the helicopter. I heard about the helicopter tipping back and that we weren't going to be able to use it. I knew that I was going to be sitting on that ridge with a lot of pain in my leg. All the key players meet up and the safety officer, smoke jumper Scott Cook, makes a suggestion. And Scott goes, yeah, let's just break this down into various components. Let's make it an incident within an incident within an incident. And at that point, we delegated 
by our expertise and our training. With his aviation background, Dave Esty is the IC of the Life Flight helicopter situation. Since medevac spot one is now blocked, medevac spot two is the next logical option, and Sean Borgen is the IC of its construction. Matt Counts continues as IC of patient care. Brent Johnson is still division soup and can focus the other resources on keeping the fire away from the injury scene. The good thing is we have a flight nurse and all the things that that ship is carrying. And so we were able immediately after that flight nurse got out, he was able to get out and more oxygen to him and then some, some pain medications, which were definitely in order. Medication seemed to work because as we were sitting there, I felt a lot more relaxed. I don't know if it was because of a psychological thing or if the medication was working on the pain in my leg. By now, it's obvious that we're starting to really build a, a pretty tight cohesion, tight cohesive organization up there. It's obvious that the players, uh, the people involved here are all professionals and all um, hitting pretty much on all cylinders with our decision making. And, and, um, and so that the comfort for me was, was great that you know, all this is, is flowing. So pulled the trigger, sent uh, Bert up with the saw teams, had them start on the hell spot, just tripping the outer trees. And, and one thing you wanna, you know, this is good to get out to people when you're, when you're building those medevac spots, you know, flag out your, your radius that you're gonna cut out and start at the outside and work your way in, you know, that way you're not tripping on all the stuff, you know, so, and we trained for that and Bert knew that. And so that's what they did. They went up, they kind of flagged the perimeter and started. And, and about the time they got started, Dennis Geving and a couple other jumpers showed up with a saw and put them in helping to trip stuff and just made sure that the saw teams were in a safe uh, working environment in relation to each other. So now what's happening is the flight medic and the paramedics and the EMTs, half a dozen folks, are around Matt keeping him stable. I've got three falling teams up at medevac spot two tripping trees. There's some 20 other random crew members and personnel around now. They all drop down and start helping Dave shore up the aircraft. After confirming that the helicopter was stable enough to work around, they hauled in rocks and dirt to temporarily keep it from slipping farther off the pad. Meanwhile, an order was placed for hardware to secure it until later action. They got us come alongs, snatch cables, and long lines up within 15, 20 minutes of that call. We were fortunate enough to have live trees that I could tether off the helicopter and winch it stable from two various points, triangulating it to keep it not only from slipping down the hill but from rolling. My order for the second helispot was just get all the trees tripped and then we can come back and buck it up and clear it later because once the trees are down the overhead dan danger is uh, mitigated and we can bring all the people up into this area. So as soon as all the trees were down then I called these guys and said send the bulk up. So a small army shows up and then we just got all the saws going, bucking it and clearing the spot out. And then they went to hacking on the rock and carved, chiseled a, a pad out of this knife rock ridge. Once the spot was secure, then we called the helibase and said, we're ready to go with second medevac spot, come and assess it. The construction crew once again becomes the conveyor crew and moves back down the ridge to Matt. The agency helicopter 352 takes off and heads to the medevac spot for patient transportation. Once the, the, the A-star came over and assessed it, said he liked it, I went ahead and said, okay, start moving them up. And they started conveying him in. And by the time the ship did uh, two or three more laps orbiting out um, and then decided on the best way to approach and land, came in and sat down, the patient was within 20, 30 yards. A briefing determined how to load the patient and which medical personnel would ride along. Hot load, yeah, rotors were turning, uh, put him in, and they, it was obvious that they had trained with, with similar scenarios at least because they scooted that backboard in. Uh, the paramedic had all the hard points all ready to go for strapping it down. They, you know, they knew which door to leave open, what, you know, exactly that ship showed up ready to go with what we needed. It, it was seamless within moments, got him in, got him packaged, they jumped on board and they were gone. 
Helicopter 352 flies Matt to the helibase and he is transferred to a National Guard Black Hawk helicopter. It's a faster flight in a larger enclosed environment and they fly him to a Boise hospital. Yeah, it was a good thing. Everything went great, but uh, you know, then I wanted to uh, be with Matt then, uh, so I hiked down the hill, but it was a, you know, everybody took a good long break, you know, it was a relief, you know, but then we had one more thing to do is uh, get that helicopter safe, so. But my job at that time was to go down and support Matt and make sure he was all right. Once Matt was extracted off the mountain, the second life flight ship came in. They dropped off a mechanic. He determined that we could pull it up on top of the hill. So with that in mind, we assembled all the crew together. And the first thing we had to do was tip the helicopter upright we had to cut a log, lay it on the skids, get everyone to stand on the log and on the front of the skids, and then the mechanic told people where they could actually push on the helicopter without damaging the helicopter. Okay. We uprighted the helicopter, tightened all the cables we had on it. Once it was shored up again at a level position, we were able to, between come-alongs and old manpower, manhandle it up onto the pad. I think the mechanic checked it out a little more. Checked it up. Checked they did a, did a run up, and then they flew up. A facilitated learning analysis interviewed all the key players and summarized their thoughts. One of the main lessons learned was that while there is no agency requirement for EMTs to be a part of a fire crew, many crews do often possess multiple EMTs or paramedics, many of which have trained at their own expense and risk of liability. The agency needs to provide financial or career development incentives to firefighters who are willing to pursue training as EMTs, as well as opportunities to maintain currency throughout the United States. Also, agency aircraft are best suited to deal with accidents that occur on the fire line. More agency helicopters need to be equipped with the capability to perform extractions for medical emergencies. Another big concern was not being able to communicate with the life flight helicopter. It was recommended as part of preseason training that agencies coordinate procedures and radio frequencies with medical evacuation organizations and then revisit throughout the season. It's probably the coolest demonstration of uh, you know brotherhood camaraderie that I've ever seen moving to, to say the least uh, towards the end of the fire the the crews that remained everybody coughed up from their own welfare funds or their own pockets and had a donation event um, and raised uh, the equivalent of a couple of fire checks for Matt uh, which was the coolest thing I've ever seen. And it was um, three or four ch cans of chew, kind of just basically going around and um, uh, bidding, uh, bidding on those items. And uh, I can tell you that the, uh, I think our crew picked up the most expensive can of chew in history to the tune of uh, $2,500, so. <laughs> we still have the can of chew. It's not gonna be open, it's gonna be posted on the wall. <laughs> yeah, the first can of chew went for $500 and I thought that was absurd and then it kept going up from there and I was like, it was, it was, it was crazy. It was a lot of fun. With the support of the Wildland Firefighter Foundation, I made it home back to New Hampshire to be cared for by family and friends and start taking classes. Um, when I opened up the check, I was in pretty much in shock. I always tell my brother, he's a firefighter too, I always tell him that I have one brother in the fire community and it's him, but after having that evolve, I realized that the firefighters stick together more than I had thought. We're more than just fellow employees. 